So we continue our discussion to explore how French retailers are adapting to evolving consumer preferences and technological advancement. How they are creating unique, immersive shopping experiences, including the online shopping in a, in a very competitive market. So how they are applying the famous French, uh, uh, French touch I invite Abby Sam Thomas, the editor in uh, the editor uh, in chief of Entrepreneur Middle East, uh, that he will moderate our panel with his esteemed guests. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, rather I should say. Um, I know it's the last panel of the day. I know that it's been a long day, but we are going to try and make this as interactive, as engaging, as fun as possible. So uh, my request to everyone in the room, you know, we don't have a lot of people. So if you want to feel feel uh, free to come and you know, join us in the front, please feel free to do so, so that we can see your faces. And like I said, we'll make this as engaging as possible. My former boss used to say, you know, if you sit in the back, you stay in the back. So uh, that's, that's, the <laughs> that's, the one, that's the warning I will give you. So, you know, please feel free to come and join us in the front. Uh, we'll make this as engaging as possible. Cool. Um, so, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is A.B. Sam Thomas. I'm the editor-in-chief uh, of Entrepreneur Middle East. Um, at the outset, you know, I just want to thank Business France and, of course, uh, Business France Middle East especially for inviting me and my publication to be a part of this event. Uh, I do hope, uh, you know, it's been a really great, insightful event so far, and I do hope our session will add to the insights shared at this particular event. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Entrepreneur, uh, it's a global brand, it's a global media platform that is quite literally the voice of entrepreneurship around the world. Uh, we are representing the Middle East edition of the Entrepreneur brand. We have been operating in the region since 2014. We are based out of Dubai in the UAE, but we cover the entire region, including Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, Kuwait, and you know, uh, Lebanon, and all the way to Jordan, and even to Morocco and Egypt, of course. Um, our print magazine is published monthly, and we also have a digital arm, entrepreneur.com, uh, which we update on a daily basis. And, you know, besides the media side of our business, we also do a lot of things like events, conferences like these, um, training and development, and, you know, lots more. Um, now, at Entrepreneur, you know, we are, as a publication, are especially interested about people who start businesses, people who run businesses, and, you know, speaking from as someone who was born and raised in the Middle East, you know, it is something we, we get really excited about seeing, you know, entrepreneurs from the region expand globally to other markets. And we see the same excitement when we see, you know, businesses from abroad coming and setting up shop in our region. So it's that latter part of the statement that, uh, you know, we are going to be exploring in this particular panel discussion. Um, that is basically businesses that want to set up shop in the GCC. Um, and we are going to look at it through the lens of France, of course, and also specifically through the lens of the retail industry. Now, uh, this panel has been called French Touch in the Gulf. Uh, please forgive my French. It's, I'm, I, we are going to try and distill the je ne sais quoi, I think, <laughs> of, of French businesses and what makes them so great in our region. Great lineup of speakers, honestly. Uh, and I just want a quick uh, introduction, and then we'll go deep dive into their uh, thoughts and panels. First up, uh, on my left, uh, Geoffrey Bonatel, Chief of Staff to the President of Shalhoub Group. Uh, next to him, we have Michel Ben Omer, CEO of Otem Holding. Uh, next to Michel, uh, Noor Al Tamimi, uh, a serial entrepreneur, honestly, but perhaps best known for being the founder of Bidashing Beauty Lounge and a board member for the Abu Dhabi Business Women Council and the Abu Dhabi Chamber of Commerce. Uh, next to Noor, we have Ziad uh, Asmar, who's the Executive Director of Darwish Holding, joining us all the way from Qatar. And last but not the least, Pascal Abshi, General Manager for French Department Stores, LLC, uh, better known perhaps for Gallery Lafayette in Dubai. All right, uh, to kind of like start off this discussion, I think uh, we could Perhaps talk about the retail landscape and the GCC. It maybe give an overview of what's happening in the region, um, and you know the potential it presents for French businesses looking at the region as a place to grow and expand. Uh, Geoffrey, I'm going to start with you um, again, speaking from your experience at Chalhoub, like a French heritage brand, and of course your years of experience in the region. Um, yeah, can you give us like a, a kind of like a broad overview of the landscape and why it should matter to French businesses uh, looking to grow and expand? Thank you, A.B., and thank you for having me on this panel. It's a great pleasure and a great honor. 
to be with you. Um, it's true that the Shalhoub family and the Shalhoub group has played a key role in the, in the shaping of the luxury market, retail market in, uh, in the region, because the, the Shalhoub family is from uh, Damascus, from Syrian origin, uh, and they started exploring the Gulf in the 60s and 70s, so very, at a very, very early stage. The UAE, uh, just to give you a kind of a background information, we were founded in 71, so uh, even before the this state wa was, was even created. And they arrived with brands like uh, Christophe, uh, like uh, Jean Patou, like Estée Dupont, so very French brands. And they really shaped the luxury market in the region in a very pioneer way. So they have, I was not there at that time, as you can imagine, but they have a very, very deep understanding and knowledge of, 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 the, of the region. And I think it's fair to say that they have really contributed to shape what a uh, luxury retail market is today in, in, the, in this part of the world. Um, and this is a very diverse market, actually. And I'm sure if I were to ask everyone in the room to close their eyes and to think what, what they see when they think luxury in, in the Middle East, they, will, they would probably uh, tell me I've seen uh, Burj Khalifa, Dubai, uh, Dubai Mall. Uh, and well, this is true, but this is not the only thing of the luxury retail market in, in, in the Middle East. Today, we estimate that, and I'm talking more luxury retail than retail at large, but uh, um, we estimate the luxury market in the Middle East around $12, million, $12 billion, which represents 4% of the global luxury personal goods uh, worldwide. Um, and uh, out of this 12 million, 49% come from UAE, so not even Dubai, UAE, 24% uh, from Saudi Arabia, then we have Kuwait, Qatar, and Bahrain. And I'm not going to kill you with data, I promise. Um, what is interesting is that Dubai is a mostly, it's a touristic driven market. Tourism from all over the world, but also tourism from the region. So from Saudi, from, uh, from Qatar, from Kuwait. Um, Saudi Arabia is, um, for instance, to give you, a, a, in terms of beauty, if I take the segment of beauty, luxury, uh, Saudi Arabia is the number one market, and then UAE. If I take fashion, it's UAE first, then Kuwait, then Qatar, then Saudi Arabia. So I think it gives you a fair picture on how diverse those markets are. So it's not only Dubai, and I think that's one of the risks when you, when you are a brand that wants to enter this market, to think only Dubai. The market goes much beyond Dubai. But there are some communities as well and some things that are relatively common to this region. It's a young population. 45% uh, of the population is below 30 years old. So it gives a, a very specific touch. It's a French touch, but it's a very specific touch. The youth of the population, uh, it's also, and probably it's linked to this first thing, it's a very digital first population. Uh, we have 99% in Saudi Arabia, 99% internet users in Saudi Arabia. It's massive. Uh, and the population spend, people in average spend three hours on, on social media per day. So it's a, it's a, it's a massive consumption of social media. Uh, people as well who love the shop, shopping experience, love malls, love physical retail. So they are at the same time very digital, but m much more uh, about physical experience than probably uh, in the rest of the world. So it's, it's a vast market, it's a diverse market, but with a certain number of commonalities that needs to be taken into account when you want to, to enter this market. I think you kind of like set up my discussion for me, so I'm very thankful to you. So you talked about like one is the region and the breakdown it, it, we need to consider. The second thing is of course trends. We'll come, that, come to that in a little while. I do want to talk about this uh, regional aspect because there is that fear, I should say, or rather the mistake that brands make when they think like GCC is a homogeneous kind of region. No, every market has its own appeal, ha has its own style, has its own uh, nature. Uh, Michelle, I would like to hear from you if you can. Uh, you know, just coming from Saudi Arabia, perhaps talk about you know the landscape and, again, given your experience uh, bringing French brands to the market, you know what you've seen that works. What have you seen that doesn't really work? Uh, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Uh, before I start answering your question, I would like to give a quick brief about Latham Investment. Latham Investment, they have uh, seven sectors under the the group we are working in real estate with the next 24 projects coming in the next three years 
We have uh, hotel sectors with almost 2,000 uh, keys or room. Uh, we are one from the biggest entertainment uh, companies in the Middle East. Uh, we're running business in Saudi and uh, UAE and uh, Qatar, uh, Bahrain and Egypt. We're working in uh, fashion sectors and food, uh, cinema. Uh, as running of our uh, business, we're looking for uh, each countries with different uh, treatment or different strategic uh, because the GCC uh, they have different uh, in the market and uh, foreign investors they need to be aware of, uh, from this start from culture and uh, the market and they need to start uh, their business starting from the market research because each country has uh, their specialty and they need also to start with the forum uh, channel like in the France uh, uh, centers of uh, or France uh, business or their uh, France uh, MBC or uh, uh, link to Saudi uh, also for the investor where they started with the link of the vision 2030. For us as al Uthaim, we working with different franchise for the fashion, and uh, uh, entertainment, and we have successful partnership with uh, brand like uh, Kiabi or Gimo in uh, the fashion sector, and we're working with the franchise of uh, Esport in the entertainment. Thank you. Uh, Ziad, I kind of want to bring you in as well. Again, when we talk about Qatar, it's a, it's a different market altogether. Can you talk about the specificities of that? Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you for hosting me. And, uh, I do agree with the gentleman that yes, maybe the GCC is a kind of a homogeneous place, but I believe strongly that uh, each country has its own specificities and its own customer behavior. And uh, in Qatar, uh, what is really a little bit uh, different from maybe other countries uh, around us is that uh, we still rely mainly on locals in the shopping experience. So 80 to 85% of our customers are Qataris still. And uh, this, is, this creates kind of a different dynamics versus the other countries. Uh, Qataris are one of the highest GDP per capita. So they are high spenders. They are sophisticated, uh, searching all, uh, all, all the time for novelties, for new products. And, uh, uh, high spenders. So this is key uh, uh, in our market to to cater to such requirements because we believe at the end that uh, these people want always uh, uh, the latest, the newest, and uh, it is very key to play on this part. Otherwise, uh, uh, we will lose them, and uh, it's not a matter of choosing something else. They will go and search for it elsewhere. So it is very key for the brands uh, uh, in order to kind of be able to succeed and perform in the market, to, to provide uh, the best what they have uh, on a timely basis. And uh, we have to know that as well that the customers, the local customers are very much affected with, with what they see online and what they see in, uh, in the other market, especially in Europe. And uh, here as well, it comes uh, for a challenge uh, for these brands to, uh, to be able to be, uh, act somehow real time with the other markets in order to to make it happen, especially in, when, when it comes to luxury. To note that we are a big group uh, representing many uh, many sectors. We have four verticals in technology and appliances, and uh, where we represent mainly uh, the majority of of the technological and appliances brand in the market. We have uh, as well FMCG, where we represent uh, Group L'Oreal as uh, the French. Uh, a group and we are into the luxury fashion and jewelry where we have uh, Chanel, we have Bouchon, uh, mainly as French and Rolex watches and uh, we are into, into the cosmetics and fragrances. Uh, so uh, we cater many, many, many different sectors and we believe that uh, uh, the, 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 local, uh, the local market in Qatar sometimes uh, the brands come and generalize it versus the other markets and they find that it is challenging or not able to perform other other markets. 
it has to, to have as, uh, as well the local, uh, the local choice of partner is key in here because we feel that uh, uh, in Qatar they like, uh, th there is a way or uh, uh, they, they like to always shop from a, a local, in a local uh, environment and experience. And uh, so we believe that sometimes uh, the local partner plays around 50% of the job and then the brand comes and pays the other 50%. Uh, Noor, I, I kind of want to bring you into the discussion. Again, we, we've been talking about like, you know, how it's such a diverse consumer base. They come from different backgrounds. So again, from your perspective as an entrepreneur, you've seen the business ecosystem flourish and grow over the years. Um, you know, what should you know, French retail businesses or what, should, what are the gaps that remain that French retail businesses should be looking at when looking into the, you know, exploiting or ex not exploiting, I should say, taking advantage of the GCP. Definitely. Um, I would like to expand uh, on the point uh, that was uh, mentioned by Jeffrey here uh, about uh, the diverse community of uh, our region and mainly uh, the UAE. Uh, yes, the UAE uh, has become a regional hub. Uh, we have uh, continuous inflow and expansion of residents, high net worth residents coming from all over the world, adding even further and more diversity to our country. Uh, we have our citizens uh, who are always forward thinking because of uh, the strategy of our leadership. Uh, we are um, very highly digital as uh, Mr. Jeffrey mentioned. And this is with all, not only with the youth and with the younger generations. Uh, you have, for example, great grandmas who are 70 year, years old who lived 50 years ago in a tent and now is on Snapchat. So we are quite uh, uh, tech savvy. And if you want a common uh, factor between uh, the diverse uh, community in the UAE, it's dev definitely the digital factor. And this is how uh, French brands can definitely reach uh, the market uh, with a strong a strong uh, digital marketing uh, strategy with a strong social marketing uh, strategy, uh, picking uh, the right uh, target market and then expanding uh, from that uh, target market across uh, different uh, markets. So um, this is the, 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 the best uh, strategy to enter into our um, market. Now, uh, definitely there is a great uh, representation of uh, luxury uh, French brands in our region. And also at the same time, there is great representation from staples, uh, from supermarket brands, let's say Danone, uh, let's say L'Oreal. Uh, where I see the gap is the mid-range uh, brands. Um, the past uh, three days, I've been strolling across the roads of uh, uh, Paris, uh, probably like walked around 20 kilometers. So uh, endless, uh, amazing brands uh, of services, of bakeries, of uh, uh, mid-level fashion brands that I don't see in, uh, in our uh, region and uh, where there would be a huge demand. Like you see, uh, you see high representation of uh, such level, mid-level uh, brands from America, uh, from Sweden, uh, from Spain, uh, but not much uh, from France. And uh, I wonder what's the reason for that. And there is definitely an appetite uh, for uh, the French uh, brand uh, and French made uh, or French inspired brands in our region. Uh, Pascal, a perfect uh, opportunity to like kind of throw the mic at you. Um, again, you know, Gallery Lafayette Dubai, when, when it launched, it was like a huge deal. But you have, uh, uh, we have had this conversation before, but it was a learning experience for you. Can you talk about that experience about like actually setting it up and, you know, operating to the audience in the Gulf and how, how that differed from what you had in France as well? Well, Abby, when I think about it, we opened Gallery Lafayette in Dubai in 2009. Most of us do remember 2009, it was quite an interesting year, right? And, and if we think about 2009, 2020, 2023, we've had the biggest world crisis, economic crisis in the, in the modern history. We've had the emergence of a new uh, segment, which is the digital, the e-retail, that also disrupted completely the industry. We moved on to also having the COVID crisis in 2020. So I think what we need to understand is that Dubai is not only a representation about what goes on around the world. We are affected by all of that, but also we are affected by a local dynamic. 
So uh, when you are managing any operation today, wherever in the world, and specifically in Dubai, that is such a mixed environment, you need to start by asking yourself, who are you? What is your added value? Yes, we are Galeria Lafayette, we are an iconic department store worldwide, and we imagine that everybody knows us. And then what? So we had to understand what is our environment, what do consumers want, and we have to listen to them, adapt, and you keep on adapting and changing until you feel you get connected to this environment. Plus, coming from France and as being a French department store, you would think we, we would think we would know it all about the fashion and the fashion world and all of that. But then again, the world is not Paris. So you need to understand uh, the Emirati market, but you have to understand also the world market. Because Dubai is not only about Emiratis or expats. It is also about all those populations and tourists that do come from all across the world. So it's a very complex environment. If you don't stay and think about who you are really, what are you going to, pro to propose to those people, understand what you are and what you need to offer, then you will fail. It is fundamental to start by asking the right questions and then maybe you will get it right and definitely you have to start all over again every once in a while because the environment is constantly changing. And I, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, bounce on uh, what Noor was saying. Yes, there is a definitely still a big need in the market when it comes to the uh, middle market. But also I think the world is changing and Dubai specifically is a very high representation of that transformation is that we used to know the world as almost everything a bell curve, right? Uh, we had the small at the beginning on the lower end, you had the uh, middle market being the biggest share of the market, and then you have the luxury, you know, for the few happy ones. Today, I think the world is transformed into a bit more complex where it is three different bell curves. We do have a market for the low income, for the lower, uh, for the, uh, what's the cheaper side of the market, and there's a big demand on that, and we see a big concentration here, where you have your Zara's and co that are taking quite a big share. Then you have your middle market today that is lost in translation. And yes, we need to reinvent it. And I think people like you or many people like uh, all the innovators that are happening now are coming and filling in that gap because there's a gap today there. And then you have the luxury that is not only catering to the middle market and to the lower, but also need to create a new positioning for those that want the exclusivity. So it is transformed into that bell curve now is into something very different from what you used to know. And if you don't understand that Dubai is an acute representation about all the transformations you have around the world, then you're going to have a hard time. So yes, understanding your market is definitely important. I think you've distilled it so well in terms of like people, again, for the businesses in the room, thinking of exploring the region, I think what he said is so true. Like You have to understand who you are and what you mean for your target consumer, but also be attuned to the latest trends happening in this landscape, not just from a local space, but also from an international uh, perspective. Uh, Geoffrey, you were talking about this in, in your initial um, um, comments that you made, you know, things like, you know, the online behavior and, you know, social media, like you said, but at the same time, we have a great culture of brick and mortar as well in the region. Like, we still like going to the malls. It might be very strange for people here in... <laughs> France, but for us, we still like going to the malls and you know having that experience. Can you talk about that? Like, how how should brands again, who are venturing into the GCC, explore these two really you know separate ways, but they still need to find a way to merge? Yeah. Thank you. It's a great question, and precisely, we don't want to separate them. At Chaloub, that's exactly what we want not to do. Um, it's true that uh, e-commerce uh, has uh, well, what's very it's, there was a paradox in the, in the Middle East. On one hand, and it has been said, it's very right, there is a high level of digitalization. People are tech savvy, very digital. Um, e internet is everywhere. But e-commerce, e-commerce specifically, was underdeveloped. Um, five years ago, it was till 2 or 3% of the luxury retail. It started moving a bit before COVID, and then obviously COVID was a perfect storm opportunity for e-commerce to grow. We had new players who entered the market, Amazon, not in the luxury field, uh, Farfetch, net a uh, Unas, which is a homegrown home, home um, uh, marketplace. Uh, and obviously COVID then accelerated everything. Today, we are around 13%. 
both in retail as a whole, as per Majid al Futaim, and 13% in the fashion luxury as per our own uh, Shallow Group Intelligence data. So we have gone a, a quite long way, uh, but we are still far from the global figures. It's 25, 21% globally, in the share of e-commerce in luxury, and Bain expected to be 32% by 2030. So you can imagine the potential to tap into in terms of e-commerce in the 10 years to come. And, and we feel uh, at Chalou that it's not about brick and mortar on one hand and uh, e-commerce marketplace on the other hand. There is a space for what we call in Europe omnichannel e-commerce. So it means that brand has to create a, a, an integrated experience between the store and their, their e-commerce website. Today, once again, and sorry for the figures, but today the monobrand.com in, in the Middle East, so the Lacoste dot com, the Louis Vuitton dot AE of this world, represent less than 10% of the e-commerce market in the Middle East. It's 90% worldwide as per McKinsey. So it's exactly the reverse. So it gives you a, a perspective on the potential that we have to grow our own website at brand level and to create for the consumer an experience that is completely integrated, whereby you can uh, buy, choose online, buy in the store, a return in the store, buy in the, what, whatever customer journey you'd like. And that's how we think we can change the experience in store, by creating this hyper convenience where you can do everything wherever you want, whenever you want. That's, I think, the number one experience. So it's not just putting uh, brick and mortar on one hand and e-commerce in a defensive manner. So it's really this hybridity which is very important. But obviously, there are a lot of things that can be done to improve the experience in the store. We need to make the store very experiential. Uh, the service, quality of service is, uh, is extremely important. Uh, you're talking about customer experiences, and Michelle, we, we had this conversation earlier. Uh, can you talk about that too? Like, you know, when we are looking at brick and mortar and experiences, you know, expected from uh, customers at retail enterprises, what, what are you seeing? How do you think uh, brands need to change their positioning when considering, uh, you know, customer experiences? Yes, I agree with you, uh, especially in our region, the people that will be continue go to the malls uh, regarding the weather and their, uh, uh, their environment and their uh, culture. Uh, how far the malls industry now is uh, changed more than the shopping or retail. Retail before it's uh, present 60% from the malls now the mixed talent is changed to be 55% uh, between entertainment and the uh, food cafes and 20% or to 25% is uh, the fashion or retail. Uh, I think uh, the retail, they need to be uh, not standalone. Uh, this will be f difficult for this industry. They need to be integrated with uh, others like what we move now as a theme, we move from malls to mixed talent, included uh, or mixed use project, included hotels, included resident, to be more also to the city to create uh, more offer and option to the customer. Right. Sorry, go ahead, Pascal. I, I would like to add something to what you're saying is that. We tend always to want to segment things as if they are different worlds. And we talk about a retail versus brick and mortar. I think if you look at our kids today, at my kids, for example, they don't make the difference between the two. It's very fluid for them as an experience. So one day they, wanna buy, they might need to buy something uh, on the net, and the next day they want to go for the experience, and they go to brick and mortar. And, and yes, the entertainment is becoming a big element of the shopping experience, and they still love to go to the malls for the entertainment part of it uh, and the getting together of it. So I, I think we cannot think of it anymore as being a fragmented world. I think we have to look at it as it is a one unique operation, and it has to be very fluid between all operations, and it should be seamless for the client. The front is like that. Making it like this for the back end is a bit more complicated. And this is where you really need to work on your systems to have all the data into one location, to have all the processes, all the journeys built within that will also make it seem seamless. And this is the complication and the transformation I think we're all going through. And there's so much potential in that because 
going back to knowing your client. It's crazy. Now we can really understand the needs of the clients and we can really try to cater to them and make the whole experience a bit more easy for them. It's, I think we are living in very exciting times. It's going to be complicated, yet exciting. I think, uh, again, this is, this, as anyone who has done online shopping and wanted to return an item can uh, attest to it. Yes, sometimes it can really get complicated. And what we want is a very seamless, simple thing. But yeah, returning an item often uh, takes you know, the life out of me. Uh, I also want to talk about you know, you know, the, the perception of French brands and you know, what they mean for us in the region and you know, how that, that concept of, like, uh, like we are talking about, the French touch has changed or has evolved. Noor, I, I know you had some thoughts about this. Like, you know, what do you think is the perception? How is that changing? How is that uh, evolving? Um, definitely, uh, the French uh, brands uh, uh, resonate within the consumer's mind as an upscale, as a as a good quality, and uh, and uh, the consumers uh, would pay a premium for uh, French brands. Uh, what I would like to suggest is that. Uh, for gaining even more market share, rather than limiting uh, to ourselves to French-made or specific country-made, it can uh, brands can still adapt the French values, but uh, be made uh, somewhere else, outsourced to nearby countries, uh, and uh, but at the same time st remain positions uh, pos positioned in the minds of consumers as a French brand. Take for example Apple. Apple is positioned as an American brand, but in reality, every component is made uh, somewhere else in the world. And this can also be uh, the case uh, with, uh, with the French uh, brands. And it's easier than in that case to scale, and it's easier to gain a bigger market share. So this would be my uh, advice on that. Uh, Ziad, same question for you again. How has the perception changed at all? And, you know, again, the diverse consumer base that we're talking about, has that um, you know, perspective also. Uh, again, talking about Qatar and the Qatari customers, I guess French products are un unquestionably the, the sign and of luxury and quality. But uh, uh, here we're witnessing as well with the online and the new generation coming that uh, the millennials and the new generation are asking, are, are uh, 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 attached to brands, but they are searching for more quality price category in these brands because they are not so much convinced about always paying so much brand. so uh, uh, innovation and uh, launching a new uh, uh, new segments or new uh, models or new categories in these brands is key to keep attracting these people plus marketing is very important because uh, for sure marketing will be key to attract and to keep this supremacy of uh, of the french products and I would like to come back to the topic of the medium uh, uh, brands or other brands that we don't see in our region that Noor mentioned that, yes, I do agree that uh, uh, practically uh, our market is, a, is a, whether a high-end market or a low-end market. The in-between is missing. And here the challenge comes from two parts, I guess. First of all, I have to admit that French companies have a problem, especially when it comes about the medium categories, because these people... I feel that these companies, when we approach them or we talk to them, they are not ready to go international. Sometimes an English presentation is missing for them. So uh, they are so French and they need, if they want to acquire and go into such new international markets, they need to be more international in everything they see and look and mindset. This is one. Two, uh, usually in our part of the world, uh, we are interested only in successful and visible brands. And we are lazy to go, and or not lazy, for a small market like, for Qatar, like, like Qatar, for example. If a, a brand is not well established and well visible in Europe or somewhere else, neither the distributor nor the brand itself will come and invest in marketing or into visibility to promote itself in a market like Qatar. So, but they, have to, they need to have a global kind of vision for the region. And when they tackle the region in this vision, they will be more, uh, if you want, you want uh, they can justify the return on investment and they can spend on promoting their brands. So they have to be ready to go international, they have to invest in the brands, and they have to choose a good partner who can really do the job in the territories they want to go in. Sorry, Geoffrey, do you want to add something? Or, yeah. 
Yeah, two comments on uh, on two things that have been said. First of all, the um, the absence of mid market uh, brands, which is very very spot on and very true. Um, there may be as well a misconception in the French in the French population on the uh, on the structure of the population of the GCC countries. I think we see them probably much more polarized as they really are. With, and we see in the Middle East a, ri a rise of middle class, uh, especially in Saudi Arabia, but also in, in the United Arab Emirates and in all the countries. And I think we probably, you know, there are these kind of uh, um, image where we have only very, very wealthy people surrounded by, uh, by, by relatively uh, uh, poor, poor people. Um, so I think it's it's probably a, mis a misconception, uh, and that, like that could be one of the reasons behind the absence of these brands uh, in the in the Middle East. Uh, another thing I, I would maybe uh, still reacting on um, on what Noor said on on the how the French brand could uh, like get produced outside of France, uh, and I think here I, I would differentiate between the luxury and, and maybe other categories. I think in luxury. What creates the value of luxury and, and, and the reason why French brands are so strong in the Middle East is for me because there is a magic behind behind this. And this magic comes from craftsmanship, from the savoir, the, un, the, the heritage, the unique savoir-faire. Um, and when you buy, um, what defines luxury? You can define luxury by uh, price positioning. And it's convenient to say that well, whatever, is whatever is more than X is luxury. It's simple. But... What creates the desire is not the price. What creates the desire is the scarcity, the fact that a product is, is difficult to produce. It, it can be only produced by people who have spent years doing it, uh, who have taken years to learn how to do it, uh, who takes hours to shape it, to create it. And the fact that between two handbags that could look the same, those are different pieces. It cannot be industrialized. And there is, in my opinion, something magical behind this idea and I'm not sure that when you go into, the, and French are quite good at understanding this, I don't, I'm not sure that that can be delocalized. And what we see on the contrary is French luxury brands reinsourcing some production that were outsourced outside France, in France, because I think they understand, or they think, or they believe that that's something that's absolutely uh, interlinked to, to the idea, the, the very idea of what luxury is about. I would agree for maybe brands like Apple, which are more uh, mass brands, or some, some are also luxury, but a different kind of, of, of luxury. You know, from, from this discussion, all, all I mean, the, again, I, I come from entrepreneur, right? For me, it's like, that's a gap, that's an opportunity. So for, again, the entrepreneurs in the room, you know, mid-market is, is a wide open gap. Somebody just needs to go in and capitalize on it, is what I'm hearing from this discussion. So let's hope uh, we'll see... Uh, you know, movements in that direction after this uh, particular event. Um, I think we need to close down because it's almost uh, coming to the end of the conversation. But uh, for anybody who has questions, by the way, I really would like to open up the floor. So if you have questions, yeah, feel free. I'll come back to you in five minutes. Just going to go uh, run down the panel. Um, you know, we've been talking about businesses who want to set up shop in the GCC. Uh, Pascal, starting with you and going all the way to Geoffrey, just advice advice for companies that are setting up shop again if you can list it as points or you know just three directives that would be great i'll try to make it simple first of all you need to do your proper studying before you go into the market understand it then you need to go question everything that you studied and test it on the market because you probably failed on understanding it and and the most important thing for me and this is a lesson i learned sometimes you don't have not to be afraid of breaking it all up and rebuilding it. So if you're going to go into such a complicated market, you know that change is going to be the rule. So be ready for change, accept the fact that it's going to change, and, and keep moving. Uh, Ziad, over to you. And in my opinion, since we are addressing mainly locals, whatever, yes, there are a lot of experts in the region, but locals are the main hub who will be spending, especially when it comes to luxury. Any brand who has to come to the region has to, uh, first of all, have a strong roots and uh, be able to uh, test a little bit the acceptance and the, uh, uh, of, of the GCC uh, community when they come to Europe, let's say. Or, and if they feel there is such 
uh, basics, fine tune uh, the requirements and, and go. And uh, if they feel there is a such act acceptance, they go all the way because uh, they, they, can, they can succeed and they can. They need to understand the specificity of the countries. Maybe, yes, Bahrain, Qatar, Kuwait maybe are small, but uh, believe, believe me, they are so complex and difficult when it comes uh, in succeeding in Saudi or UAE. It's is is not true that you can make it in Bahrain or in Kuwait or in Qatar. So they need to understand the customer behavior and uh, go all the way as well. Understand the market and then go all the way. Uh, Noor, over to you. Um, so, uh, me being an entrepreneur and mainly representing uh, the SMEs, uh, I would say that big corporations have the resources, have the knowledge, have the strategies to expand, have the studies, but that's not the case with the small and medium enterprises. They need more support, they need more focus, and they need more resources around them. Um, so um, my maybe as a, a specific suggestion that I would like to give to uh, Business France, perhaps, and it is a, a, a digital uh, marketing uh, campaign that highlights the, let's say, the Frenchness and uh, the sophisticated uh, feeling of uh, French brands and the uniqueness and flair of French brands, and uh, of course, backing up uh, the SMEs and focusing uh, on them when it comes to road shows, when it comes to exhibitions, and B2B matchmaking meetings in our regions. Thank you. I think Miriam and the team are like taking down notes as we speak. <laughs> Michelle, go ahead. Uh, I, think, uh, I think they need to find the right partner. This is very important, and the right process to uh, enter any market. Look for the right partner, yep. Three things, patience, patience, patience. Um, no, no, joke apart, um, people usually see um, the Middle East and rightfully so as a fast growing market, full of potential, full of energy, a very strong can-do attitude, and they <clears throat> tend to think, and th that's where the mistake starts, that it's an easy win, it's a longing fruit, and it's not. Uh, for the reason that you need to understand the consumer, it's six countries and GCC, six countries, uh, Saudi Arabia is a different region, so you need to, it's not like, uh, it's the size of France, but France in six countries and, and so a very vast territory. So patience is key, build the, the ecosystem, understand the ecosystem. So uh, in something I see sometimes, uh, not to see Wishalu, but as a president of the French Chamber of Commerce in, in the UAE, people arrive thinking that everything will come as a, will be successful overnight, uh, and it's not necessarily the truth. It takes time, mm -hmm. but if you have the patience to do it properly and uh, and to do it right, then succeed will come. Absolutely, I think. Yeah, uh, again, this goes back to the start of this discussion. Don't come in with preconceived notions. You have to do the work. Uh, the region has a lot of potential, but yeah, you need to do the work. I'm going to go in for questions, please. Oh, okay, cool. Any other questions? Uh, if, yeah, please. Can you come up to the front if you don't mind? If you can just introduce yourself and then go ahead, ask you. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for your talk. I'm Yasmin Boumrar. I'm the CEO of an investment company in Dubai. And uh, I can clearly see the gap you are talking about it. I have a question for you all uh, regarding the implementation of the immersive shopping. Uh, we all, <laughs> I, we, I didn't hear about it uh, during your talk especially the usage of Vision Pro, Apple Vision Pro, and the metaverse. Uh, what do you think about it? How do you tackle this market? And uh, do you think there is a market, uh, especially in the GCC region? Thank you very much. So I guess is the question is about, you know, all of these augmented experiences that are coming into the market. Are you using it in your businesses already? Yeah, Pascal. Actually, it is uh, something we are all looking into uh, very intensely because having some form of immersive experience within your shopping experience is going to happen. It can go from having your cabin with a magic cabin, the magic mirror, uh, things that will help you and support your decision making when you're shopping, and it can go as far as the metaverse where you are totally immersed and creating into a parallel world somehow. So uh, the question is, how fast should you go? 
and how far should you go between the investment and the return on investment. And, uh, and I would say that typically the metaverse, I would believe, and that is a guess, will probably be led by people that are going to be, like at the beginning, pure players, people that will really reinvent this universe because it is something to be completely created at Nihilo, I would say. Uh, and we are just at the beginning of the metaverse, so we don't know how fast it will go or how far it will go. Uh, however, the other elements of augmented reality, I think, are today already part of the shopping experience. When you're in beauty, for example, uh, I think most now department stores have magic mirrors and are using uh, many tools such as the, uh, for the skincare elements, etc. I'm not the best expert on that, but I can tell you that today I would not have a discussion with a brand without raising the issue, what are those added value elements that you're going to bring in terms of augmented uh, uh, reality. The rest, I think, is going to be a bit more complicated, and I'll leave it up to you, investment fund, to <laughs> lead the way and, and, and show us the way. Any other questions? Oh, yes, please. Yes. Hi, everyone. Marwa Abdurrahman Al Hashimi, Mubadala Investment Company from Abu Dhabi. Thank you, everyone, for the discussion to today. It's more of a comment rather than a question. I think that me as an Emirati woman, I think the Emirati women, beautiful women, they appreciate beauty. And uh, Her, Her Excellency, Madame Noor here, is one of the leaders in Abu Dhabi creating a luxury brand. I believe that we also have a savoir-faire from the UAE that we need to export also to the French market, and we also need to um, explore that. Thank you. Unfortunately, that was a topic I wanted to bring up, but we have run out of time. So I yes, just Pascal, say something quick on that? So yeah, I don't yeah. want to be too much interrupting. Actually, today, if in all our departments, we have in the top five at least one or two brands that are oh, nurtured God. from uh, locally that are Emirati in some form or some manner. So yes, there's a huge potential, there's a uh, pool of talent that is there that is actually now really developing very well and achieving performance. So you are totally right. And some of those brands now we're talking with Paris to have some of them now into the French market. And this is what we should be doing. We are, it's not only about taking France to the Emirates or to the GCC, it is also bridging, building a bridge where also the local talents will be able to develop and also uh, move to, to France. And definitely, it's part of our role. I totally agree. Um, no, definitely. Please. Thank you very much for your remark. It's uh, very, very valuable. And uh, this was what I always used to um, address. And uh, it's time for, for ideas and for brands to be exported as well uh, because of the diverse community we come from because of the uh, 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 forward thinking uh, of, our, uh, of, our, of our youth, of our uh, current entrepreneurs, uh, this is the case right now and this is going to be the case and it is the duty of us, uh, let's say I represent today the Abu Dhabi Chamber of Commerce, I represent uh, Business Women Council and this is definitely uh, should be part of our uh, role right now and we, sh we should definitely push for that uh, in the very near future. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, everyone. I have to wrap up. I just want to add, like, Entrepreneur Middle East is all about homegrown entrepreneurs, so feel free to reach out anytime you need support. Uh, thank you all for being such a great audience. Sheikh Alanud is going to speak next. So.